Bars loaded. 184. This is 405. Go, Chase! Come on, Chase. industry, the one true voice in the strength and conditioning profession, the most important podcast on the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, starting Strength Radio. It's Friday and it's starting Strength Radio. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm as good as Mark Wolf. If you'll listen carefully, you'll see the resemblance. Comments about? Oh, you no. Well, I, you know, we're here today with a studio audience. <clears throat> we got several guests in the studio today to help uh, help with the process of getting Chase Lindley to speak. Good luck. <laughs> Oh, he'll be fine. He'll be fine. Uh, we've had a lot of interest recently in the uh, video that we put up of Chase pressing 405. You were right at 242. So I weighed out at 110.3 kilos, which so is 240. Yeah. Two and a half, which is, you know, basically the, the old weight class, 242. Basically, the 110 weight class. So that's 405 at 242. And as a result of having shown you this relatively impressive feat of strength that probably no one in the United States at 242 has done in about 50 years, uh, we get the following responses to the YouTube video. Not bad for a standing bench press. Good job, though. Standing bench press. <laughs> Spinal conditioning. <laughs> oh, shit. Damn, this guy saved a bunch of money from buying an inclined bench. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, shit. This is so stupid. Here we go. The arbiter of things that are stupid. Johan Hansen says, This is so stupid. Doing an overhead press by first performing parallel press. Does anybody understand what, what a parallel press is? It's like doing a barbell curl by first performing a clean I understand why they removed this from the Olympics. So much wisdom concentrated into four short sentences. Just someone at like the Defense Intelligence Agency needs to hire this man, right? And here's one. The, the weight is impressive, but this excessive leaning should not be allowed. It's effectively a standing bench press. And ominously enough, this will only get worse. <laughs> <laughs> now that is, that's, what do you call that? Literary? The, the foreshadowing. foreshadowing. That's foresh foreshadowing. Hopefully it means the number goes up and not mine. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> my friend. The next time you go up, while well, your shoulders will actually be below the level of your hips. <laughs> Think about that now. Huh? What blows my mind is that you can Google the Olympic press, and there's you know a ton of photos of old Russian guys, old lifters in general, and they have 
they have an egregious arch like I do or a mm-hmm. laid back. And yet no one dog shits about that. But that's that. why it was removed from the Olympics, right? It's, that's not why it was removed from the Olympics. That's what the comments say. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Experts. yeah this, that's experts. why it was removed that's from the Olympics. That's what this is. You're right. Right. That's, I guess that's inaccurate. There's definitely a correlation. Occasionally, <laughs> we'll read things in the comments that are inaccurate. Michael Gonzalez, these are from Facebook, from the Facebook group. Oh, God. I never could agree with the stance required for this lift. And his agreement is a, so important. Call it a know. floating bench press, and it's all the same. It's all the same. See, the and, level of insight here is is just And this amazing. is my favorite. When somebody, do you know somebody named Noah Nichols? I do not. Sounds so, like a fake name. So, Martinez Jermolevius says, is he is clean? Question mark. And Noah Nichols says, yes. Because <laughs> he knows. He's also been training for this since he was 12. How, does this, how the fuck does he know? I, gee, I don't know. I don't know. These people are just such geniuses on the internet. You know, here, YouTube has decided that they're going to censor lots and lots of things, right? Not to get us censored, so I won't mention what YouTube has announced they're going to censor. But they won't censor. They won't censor these fucking morons. If you're a fucking moron, you can just type things. All right, look. How many of you fucking pussies can walk four o five out of the rack with the bar in your hands? Much less press it. In any way. <laughs> what do you... This is... How does, how does it not occur to these goddamn idiots? It's 4.05. Right? It's 4.05. At 2.42. At RPE... RPE 9.9999999998. Well, you should ask nine, him. Eight. What RPE was that, Chase? It just felt like a heavy press. Um, <laughs> like a heavy press. I know that's not really <laughs> descriptive enough, but just I actually had someone today ask me, and they go, How, "What does it feel like to hold four or five in your hands?" Like I literally asked, you know, the Ed Cohen thing of, "Was it? What is your heavy press?" And he's like, two hundred. Mm-hmm. What did it feel like holding two hundred in your hands?" I felt heavy. Felt like go. that. Yeah. Yeah, they don't. Uh, they don't understand, but. Uh, what the the amazing thing to me is is they all saw this video. Every one of them saw this fucking video. They saw the bar go up. They saw the bar go back down. And then they saw the bar go on up again. And they see that it's loaded to 405. They know you weigh 242. And they think that why, if only I could lean back as much as Chase does, I could do 405 just like he did. Because after all, the leaning back is what made it so easy. That's right. Right? That's what, the, that's what all of these goddamn idiots here are saying. It's absolutely fascinating to me that uh, uh, people have no uh, better uh, sense of perspective than this. And, uh, but you know, well, for people the- have disappointed us all recently, haven't they? So this is just another example of that kind of stupidity in action. Well, for the a- non morons though, who are asking actually good questions. There's confusion about why one red light should have been three red lights. We all agree. It should right. have been three red lights. Should have been three red lights. Still a press, you know, still counts as a PR. I imagine in your mind, but, yep. what, uh, the why the red light and all right here's all the let's talk about that well, yeah that's we and we we do need everybody's to talk about that knees, because but the knees are not the deal. everybody's everybody is is pointing out that his layback is excessive and it is whatever first one thing and another the problem with that press was the fact that it was not conducted according to the technical rules which state that the bar once it starts upward cannot go back down at any point during the movement. All right, that's in the technical rules for the press. I know it's in the technical rules for the press because I wrote the things. All right. Now, had I been sitting 
in the in the judge's chair that day, I would have red lighted that press. As unpopular as that would have been, I would have red lighted the press. And he knows that. And you recall that I went to every judge and I said, hey, the bar's going to dip. Make sure you see it. And everybody ignored me. Except, everybody ignored you. Except the Android. <laughs> except. I, I, I passed that right. on to, 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 some, to the other judges. So, yeah. Right. So it was Wilson and her and who was it? And Kyle. No, it was Climber. Oh, it was Climber. It, it was, was Climber. Yeah. So even when told what to look for, they. They got scared. They were just. No, they got well, scared. Well, look, this happens in meets. It's happened in meets this, since there have been meets. This is every West Side Barbell this is, meet. This, this is, is every one of them. This is every powerlifting meet where the number gets real, real big. Yeah. All right. It is human nature, judges being humans most of the time, <laughs> to grant some slack, to cut a man some slack when the weight is real, real heavy, certainly more than the judge himself can do. This is just what people do. This is why judging is hard. This is why uh, it, in I've seen lots and lots of times uh, in days of yore when a, when a world record attempt was going to be uh, was loaded on the bar that all of the judges were replaced with international level judges who were not afraid to turn on the red light. This is a this is an important thing that used to be done. I mean, uh, if you go to any powerlifting uh, meet in any uh, federation besides USAPL right now, uh, there is no such thing as a red light for depth in those federations. Uh, if I'm wrong, name the federation for me. But I've, you know, we've all seen videos of three white lights on squats that were six inches above parallel when there's technical rules clearly state what below parallel is uh it's just not paid attention to and these are what we call the recreational federations that's where you go to enter a meet just to have fun and break a record that you didn't really break yes apl has lots and lots and lots of its own problems lots of them Lots, lots of problems. But at least they judge depth on the squat. Okay? You have to give them that. Uh, and as a result, you know, questions have been raised about this, uh, about the legality of this press. And Chase knows this. What did you, uh, what did you think when you got three white, when you got two, two white lights on that press? I mean, there was a lot of emotion kind of running through my head. The fact that I just i have been training for this a while and I, I was kind of, you know, dreaming about this number and thinking about this for, you know, six months ahead of the actual competition, I just wanted to get the thing over my shoulders and upset. Sure. Um, and that's understandable, but did you feel the bar drop on the way up? Oh, of course, because of my layback. Right. But I knew right. that I still needed to press on the thing, and I have a tendency to do that anyways. Yeah, and you know I could have picked a, a safer number to where I could have just had a continuous upward bar path. But mm -hmm. when am I ever going to get this chance again to press four hundred five? Well, at the next meet. Yeah, but I don't know. Is the obvious answer be, to you know? that question at the next meet? But what's, I'm not worried about it. What's Look, the number where it, you can hit it without dipping the bar? Probably three eighty, three eighty five. Because I hit three ninety, and it may have stalled. But it still and, went up. And stalled is, is okay by the yeah. technical rules. It's just that right. the bar can't go back down. So, uh, But that was also at that 390, you know, it was at a heavier body weight. This one I lost because I was at 255 about a month and a few weeks heading into it. And then I just got overtrained and mm -hmm. dropped down to 242. Well, uh, it, you know, had the red lights all gone on, had the thing gotten three red lights, uh, it would nonetheless have been an impressive feat of strength. Everybody you know? would have went shit crazy yes. regardless. Right. It, it wouldn't have made any difference. Yeah. Everybody would have gone, 
oh, you know how crowds do yeah. when the when they see the red light for something they thought should have been a white light. That would that would have happened. mattered though. It wouldn't, wouldn't have mattered. It would have been, been like Rocky losing <clears throat> Apollo Creed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's it's, it's four oh five went over the man's head. I've never heard right. that room that loud. Yeah, I've it's never, uh, I've never heard that room that loud. It was quite a it was quite a deal. And uh we were all proud of Chase for having gotten this thing up. You know, and, and my concern is being involved in the meet as the announcer, Nick's concern, being involved in the meet as the director, is that the thing should have gotten three red lights. And the head judge has come up to me no fewer than five times <laughs> and apologized for having fallen down on the job. He knew better. It's just, you know, one of them deals. And So, uh, I, don't, I, I don't want anybody to think that we don't, that we we don't recognize the problem with that press, right? But I also don't want anybody to think that we think you could do it too if you only could lay back as much as Chase laid back. And get back. Two, two white lights. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking idiots. God damn it. It's amazing, isn't it? The, the, the IQ of the general public is not what you think it is. Yeah. <laughs> it, and the question it about really it, the question about is he clean, you know, that comes up all the time. Motherfucker, if you were clean, you weren't clean. You couldn't press four hundred five either. That's that's a problem. That's a point. I guess that's the only difference. Yeah. As a general rule, anybody that's stronger than I am <laughs> is taking a bunch of drugs. Well, I, I thought about that. That's a good rule of thumb. Well, don't the, you think? the comparison that they have to anyone else pressing four hundred five is Larry Wills, right? That right. dude's been on trend since. Oh right no, no, we can't say that. You don't know what he's been on. He's he's admitted it. He's admitted it. He's admitted it. Oh yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. He's talked about it. Well, or not trim, but he's on some. He's on. All right, let's substance. just say that the man is using because I don't like to accuse people of felonies. All right, <laughs> okay, okay. When I when I can't when I don't have actual proof <laughs> that they've committed a felony, you know, and if 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 the guy's using drugs, look, everybody uses drugs. Yep. Okay, everybody uses drugs except him because he can't afford it. <laughs> eventually, <laughs> eventually he'll use some drugs because he can afford it, and then God knows what he'll bring. Right. 500. But for everyone to criticize this press on the basis of the fact that he laid back, what you're in fact saying is, well, I can do that if I could just lay back as much as Chase and do a standing bench press. Well, those are easy. <laughs> standing bench presses are easy. <laughs> Any 155-pound <laughs> guy pressing 95 can say, Man, that's a that's a standing bench press. Yeah. It's obviously a standing bench press. The other goofy, well, I, you know, I, I could do that. The other goofy and interesting thing people ask is is why don't we teach the press that way? As if uh, as if you can actually lay as if you can actually teach it that way, right? If, we ha all right. Let's, if, let's, if you're gonna lay back, you're gonna lay back. If you're gonna lay back, you're going to lay back. And we, I'm gonna tell you, we've tried to teach the lay back in the press. All right. Tommy Suggs is a good friend of mine. Tommy has come up a couple of times in the past and has tried to teach some of our guys, some of our good pressers, how to actually technically do that layback that you saw Chase doing, that, that Ragamon does real well. You, I'm going to tell you right now, we can't teach you how to do that. And uh, we've tried to teach it, and we don't know how to teach it. Now, uh, I will say that in 1989, I was taught by the coaches at uh, the Olympic Training Center, the United States Weightlifting Federation at the time. It was later became USA Weightlifting. Uh, I was taught by these guys who were regarded as the best coaches in the country that you can't teach the double knee bend on a clean. And... We teach it quite successfully every Sunday morning at the seminar. So I'm not going to say that that second layback can't be taught. It may be that there will be a, a time at some point in the future that I figure out or Nick or somebody good figures out how to teach that second layback. But right now we hadn't figured out how to do it. 
What happens is when the second layback happens on a heavy press, it's just what happens during that part of the movement. And it's uh, it's it, useful, it's, and everybody does it at the at all the guys. All the you look at Sergey Redding's press, the five hundred two, and he did the thing. And even Alexiev's five hundred seven, which was really a push press, he does a second layback. All those guys did a second layback. Suggs thought he could teach it, but using what we were listening to him tell us, we couldn't get it done. It's the right. degree of layback. I think yeah, some yes. people will start to lay back, but nobody. the The thing with the with the with the double knee bend is is inherent in the movement. When you jump, you have to bend your knees again because you've extended your knees off the floor. Right. It's inherent. the the double the the double layback is not necessary to to stand up with the bar. It's not necessary for light weights. But but, but if you but if but you look there at the reaches people, a point. When did you but, learn how to double layback? I think it's from pin pressing. No bullshit. You no. were double laybacking when you were when I was here five years ago. But it has kind of. I've trained the double layback. You by practiced pin it more, but, but you were. You I had have to a learn video. it before you practiced it. I have though. a video. If anything, of him. I think it was from doing the press 1.0 whenever we originally started that. Chase, I have a video of you five years. I'm talking ago, about beforehand. A video of you from five years ago at a body weight of 170, pressing yeah. 185. In a L shape, in an L shape, and if you look at the people who double A back, Ragavan and him and Cody and Nino and Brent Brooke Carter. and Brent Carter, they're all strong and they're all flexible as shit. Yes. Chase can do a full split front <clears throat> to back, mm-hmm. you know, on demand. I'm, I'm sure you could still do it today, you know. And all those guys, Brent was a dancer. A Nino, you know, could probably put his head feet over his head. And Brooke and all these people, so it's like mm-hmm. they, they have to be flexible enough to do it. And if you're not flexible enough, you're never going to double layback. Well, I think I think also right. the the original way that we taught the press, the 1.0, that's how it kind of began, right? Because I was struggling with it, and after the initial bounce off my shoulders, I would lay back and then finish locking out the weight. So I think that's kind of how it started, and then as the weight got heavier. I just laid back more and more. That's and then well, I to, think to go back to, to what Nick's happened. Point. Right, here's the deal: when you when you start doing a double layback, the first time you do it, you go, "Oh, oh, all right, that helped." Yep. And you may not even be able to quantify what it is you just did, but you 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 know your body knows it helped. And so the next time you do it, you do it again, and the next time, and the next time, and and pretty soon it's built into the movement pattern and you can't not do it. Yeah. I have one, I have one client. Right? I, and this is, this is the way they told us mm-hmm. that the double knee bend in the clean would develop. Oh, develop the, the lifter. No, they, they didn't, they said it can't be taught. Yeah. We figured out a way to teach it yeah, though. Yeah, yeah. But with our, with the progression that we use in the clean, everybody at the end of the day is doing a double yeah. knee bend in the clean. They told me that what will happen is, the lifter over the course of, of hundreds of reps will put one of those in accidentally. And then he'll go, Oh, okay. That, that, that was easier. Let me do that again. And he'll hit. In other words, you discover it for yourself and then you'll embed it into your own motor pathway. But what we would like to be able to do is to save you the time and be able to figure out a way to explain how you do it. Uh, so that you can kind of think about it and start doing it intentionally instead of waiting for it to happen accidentally. As of right now, I haven't figured out how to teach the layback, the double layback. But what I've noticed is that once everybody gets up to the point where they're pressing heavy, even me, which is not an impressive press at all, I do a double layback. Because you just it's just something that makes the movement easier to do. I, so, it's, so the the point I think you're right. I think there's a way to 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 teach it earlier on, but the uh, and and we've started doing some stuff to get it there, right? Like pointing the chest at the ceiling, bigger yeah. bounce out of the bottom. All that stuff's going to get it there. But the the problem is that not everybody will be able to do it. Uh, right. But I, everybody, I've, but I've attempted. I've attempted. My low back will not have it. Not, just, yeah, not everybody will be able to do it, but everybody has to double knee bend on a power clean. 
You, you see what I'm saying? That's my point. Is that the double? Uh, if you're a football player and your coach doesn't care, I, but the way we teach the clean, everybody has to double knee right. bend on the yep. on the power clean. Yep. One of these days, we are going to stumble onto a way to teach the double layback because the double layback makes it easier. But what the morons are observing is that the layback is, in Chase's example, is so severe that. Uh, it just, it's offensive to their eyes. I don't care how much he's laid back. What I was concerned with is the bar dipped on the way up. And I mean, we've got to have, st- and, and you say, well, why does that matter? Well, yeah. I mean, there's got to be a standard for the lift. Yeah. And someone will figure out a way to game it. You know, if you allow the bar to dip a second time or a and third time. Or th- yeah. What you was know? the rule in the Olympics? I don't know for the press. Yeah. I don't know. I've never seen the the rule set from prior to the, the 1972 Olympics. Hmm. I've never seen what the technical rules said on that. I it, It's probably available. I'd be instructed to to look that up. But I, I'm pretty sure that the rule said that you can't push press the bar like Alexiev did with the 50s. You've seen the 507. Yeah, his knees go way the fuck it's, forward. It's, it's an obvious push press. Yep. Where he's getting rebound off of the knees and the quads. Whereas Redding did a, a layback like you saw Chase doing the thing. It was a hips rebound, not a knees rebound. And uh, that, that really pissed a lot of people off when they white-lighted uh, Alexiev's 507 that day and uh, back in 1971. And, uh, but, but really, uh, if, if you want to know why the press was eliminated from the Olympics back then, there's a big long article on our site about the history of the press by John Fair, who's a historian and has gone into excruciating detail to, to, uh, document the process of getting the the uh, press, the clean and press, removed from the Olympics. And uh, the first Olympics that was gone was in 1972. It changed the nature of the of the sport quite a bit. Uh, I think one of the one of the good things about having removed the clean and press is that I mean, who wants to watch three lifts? I don't want to be do. there all that day, you know. A bunch of people do. That's why they still have worlds and they have IPF and people. That's why they have powerlifting. I understand, but you'll have to admit that watching sixty bench presses in a row <laughs> is not the best afternoon but you've ever. It's a bench press. No one gives a fuck about a bench press because oh, you're laying down and bench it's pressers not, do. Well, yeah, bench pressers besides, give a fuck about the bench. Besides press. those people, yeah. everyone wants to see a dynamic lift that goes yeah. from no, I, on the floor. I down understand. Your shoulders. But the, the meat was long, and, and this is this is something else that has to be kept in. And I, for some bizarre reason that I've never been privy to, the Olympic lifting grants a medal for each one of the lifts. Now this is rooted in the mists of history. Uh, so when you lift in the in in Olympic weightlifting in the Olympics, you get a medal for the snatch and a medal for the clean and jerk. And I think they award a medal for the total. So there are three medals for the two lifts. And in 2020, NBC actually owns the Olympics. The Olympics is owned by the National Broadcasting Corporation. The Olympics is a creature of the media. And we all know that everything the media touches must have all the testosterone jerked out of it. Because testosterone is bad. So... If they really wanted to reduce the medal count of the of Olympic weightlifting, because that's their ostensible reason for fucking with us all the time, why don't you guys stop awarding a medal for the snatch and the clean and jerk and only award a medal for the total? Because that's what we compete with anyway. It would seem to be a, a way to, to get your medal count down without having to reduce the weight classes. Because they've reduced the weight classes for that same reason. 
They want the metal count down. Now, why? I don't know. What's wrong with more metals? Everybody likes metals. Why not have more metals? But I don't know what goes on in the mind of the people that run NBC and therefore the International Olympic Committee. Uh, no telling. Anyway, you've been training the Olympic lifts recently, haven't you? Yeah, so after the uh, the meet in November, what, it was the 14th, after that, transitioned into the Olympic lifts. Because I know you've always wanted me to do it and several other people, and I've been kind of biting my tongue about it, and I, I really don't care for them, but I see it as, do I want to be a better coach? Yes, I need to learn how to do these movements more effectively, and yeah. I also need to experience what it is doing an Olympic meet, just in case if a client right. wanted me to do it. And just have the knowledge associated with it. Sure, that's good insight. You can't coach what you haven't done. Uh, it, it's amazing to me how many people get out of PE school thinking they can coach everything. Like you had a badminton class in PE school. Now you're a badminton coach because you've got a degree in PE. It's bizarre. But it's 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 the common thing you know uh and so what do you what do you think you've learned about the olympic lifts having trained them a while now there's kind of a different approach to it um i have to become more flexible than i originally thought and i thought i had plenty of flexibility but my rack is terrible my jerk is pretty atrocious so i have to learn you know that range of motion right specifically you got to practice all exactly that. i have to practice that range of motion um, and then just the the programming associated with it, right? I can't just mm-hmm. LP my Olympic lifts. I have to now start playing with the volume and intensity mm-hmm. and all the variables. Right. Because you your strength has been trained for 10 years. Mm-hmm. And it's developed to a high level, and, and the, the skill associated with the Olympic lifts has got to be brought along. And the only way to, only way to acquire skill is to practice those lifts over and over and over. And uh, while at the same time retaining your strength by squatting heavy, pulling heavy, pressing and benching, that sort of thing. This is our kind of a different approach we have to it than, than uh, uh, the standard Olympic weightlifting model. And we'll see, you know, how far along you get in this thing. Uh, Olympic weightlifting is pretty much dependent on the genetically controlled ability to explode uh, have you tested your vertical recently, your standing vertical jump? You didn't not too long ago. It was 31 oh. because y'all thought it was like 24. And I yeah, we thought knew you that were, was wrong. We're a, were a retard. And, no. And you <laughs> actually weren't <clears throat> I mean, that I'm, big a retard. And it was 31. Probably, that's, yeah. I mean, that's it's decent. That's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, it's not 36, but no. it's better than me. And uh, it's probably better than lots of people who are actively claiming to be Olympic weightlifters, you know, little 90 kilo guys that do 90 and 120 at the state meet, that sort of thing. And call it Oli. Call it Oli, Oli, Oli. the Oli lifts. I'm lifting Oli. (laughs) Come to my Oli class. My Oli class. CrossFit has given us all these wonderful words, (laughs) haven't they? Oh, God. That's a symptom of California, though. So, yeah, yeah. It comes from California. It's you got to fuck CrossFit up all the names a, of everything. Didn't shit. Yeah. CrossFit is a creature of California. Yeah. All the Californians say instead of jujitsu or Brazilian jits. jiu-jitsu, they say j- jits. jits. Yeah, yeah. Look at these guys. Are right you here. serious? Yeah. Jits. Jeez, jits. Jits. Everything's always got to be There's reduced to. There's a funny meme. To... It's like I wonder what all the people who who say jits what they do with all the extra time they. Have. <laughs> <laughs> all the, all the extra time. They get a second career. <laughs> Pick up Start a doctor. Pick up a doctorate in yeah. education. You know. <laughs> you know. Oh, oh shit. <laughs> well, so anyway, Chase had been training with us since he was twelve. Uh, I've got a picture on the board over there of Chase when he was twelve, holding a basketball. If anything happens to that, I'll kill you. I'm not gonna tell. I don't. Want I, I, you know, I've always thought you're gonna try to pull that fucking thing down, but don't leave don't, it alone. No, I don't want it. I'll, leave uh, it alone. I'll take a picture of it and put it in the uh, 
put it in the uh, podcast. We'll just archive it. Take a picture of it in case somebody yeah. steals it, and we got to <laughs> make a copy and put it back up. That you, needs to be safeguarded. Give you some insight about that picture. I remember uh, this was for basketball my seventh grade year, and my family members or someone had told me to flex to make you look bigger <laughs> in the picture. So I'm holding the basketball with, like, my left hand, and I'm flexing as hard as I can to my bicep, and there's no change. And I was like, fuck, I got I to do it something. It looked exactly the same. <laughs> well... How precious. So, uh, so yeah, Chase started with us when he was a little fair-haired child and uh, has uh, gotten – what's your PR squat right now? I hit 655 in training before the meet. A single, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and then I've pulled 700. And what's your bench? Uh, I benched 430. 430. All right. Now, all of these numbers, of course, just in a T-shirt and shorts. And uh, I don't think you've ever even had knee wraps on, have you? Nope. Never had a pair on. I've actually gotten That's better so not cool. using my knee sleeves. Right, because I can actually feel what I'm doing wrong with the, the movement. Yeah. Uh, people just assume that knee sleeves are necessary, and they're really not. They're not. Uh, they, uh, I never liked them. Uh, I was bunched up behind my knees. And that's what the problem was. Pinched me and produced all kinds of weird geometric changes in the inside of the knee that fucked everything up. And I've got a neoprene allergy. I put those things on for 15 minutes, and I will have a rash imprint of that sleeve for two weeks. Can't wear them at all. Damnedest thing you've ever seen. 15 minutes. What color will the rash be? Pink? <laughs> Rose color. Rose. Rose color. So, uh, uh, that's, a, that's you know, just a, a, a testament to the effectiveness of five pounds per workout. You know, that gets obviously slower the stronger you get, but that's built into the model. Uh, the model works every single time it's applied, and uh, I think it's. Uh, and the programming uh, leading up to this was fairly simple, right? I mean, yeah, so I was running kind of like my own little version of five three one, but instead of the ones, I was doing doubles. Um, this is I, on the press. No, on the uh, the squats. On the squats and squats, the and then um, for the pulls, I was doing a bunch of haltings, rack pulls. Breaking up the partial range of motions, mm-hmm. and then doing you know a few deadlifts a few weeks before the meet. Right. For those of you that that uh, poo poo my idea of haltings and rack bulls that I learned from Star, uh, that works. Doesn't it? I, I was actually one of them. I thought haltings were dog shit, but they worked really damn well. I'm telling you that volume that- with the eights. You, it just you, exploded my deadlift. You do a bunch of work off the floor, then you do a bunch of real heavy partial work above that work on the floor instead of trying to just do the full deadlift all the time, which just beats the piss out of you mm-hmm. when you get up in the 600s. The haltings and the rack pulls are a very, very good way to train for a big deadlift. Now, I was at 220, I pulled. 633 on in two different meets and the only time i did the actual deadlift going into those meets was in the warm-up room at the meet right it's the only time i only time i did them and now this is in the in the before time this is back in the uh mesozoic when uh we actually had no model i actually had no model for any of these lifts in terms of the way that we think of a model for these lifts now. Uh, this is what you do when you squat. The hip drive, the push the floor on the bench, uh, push the floor on the on the deadlift, that sort of thing. All these little cues that we actually now have the advantage of being able to think very hard about during the execution of a third attempt on the platform. Uh, I didn't know anything about that. I just went out there and tried to do the squat in whatever fucking way that I could do the squat. I had no model in my mind for the lift. I had no model for the deadlift. Uh, those are fairly recent developments. And uh, 
you know when you get out there on the third attempt deadlift and you can actually give your brain a task push the floor lock the back push the bar away from the floor right i didn't have that i just was yelling <laughs> <laughs> so you guys have got some advantages over me and uh uh it's uh you know, I'd, I'd really like to see what Chase could do on a whole bunch of Diana Ball and tips. <laughs> if y'all want to start supplying me, I'm willing to, I, but I'm not paying for that. That might be real interesting what might happen to him. I don't know how it would react with his uh, type 1 diabetes, but somebody knows that. <laughs> there are people that have it'd done all three. Five, you know. It'd be a fun five to ten years. Right? It, it, Just go on the yeah. bang, man. Fuck it. Just if he goes it. out, you know. Had a great time. Had a great it. time. Had a good run, you know. Got real strong. Got real strong. <laughs> Be like that. Chuck Yeager, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Can this year get any more fucked up? We lose, we lose Walter Williams and Chuck Yeager within 10 days of each other. That's a bad, bad omen. My God. Two great men like that. Here we are yucking it up, still alive. <laughs> It's absolutely amazing. So, uh, what else did Nick want to talk about? Nick wanted to talk about how Chase is a dropout. <laughs> Chase dropped out of college. Glad now, what worked, we used to say about I'm dropouts. I'm glad it worked out for him because I told him he shouldn't go to college. I well, told him he shouldn't go to well, college. Well, hold on. So I no, no, that's but that's true. We both told you not to go to college. No, that was true. But the reason why I wanted to go to college was just to play college football. Right. I, I want I wanted that little plaque or title right. for me because no one in my family has ever done it. No, I understand that. And you know, the way you did it was probably the right way to do it. You know, go to college, play football, get out of it what you want. What you want, not what everybody wants you to have, exactly. but what you want, and then get the fuck away from those people. Because at this point in time, the 98% of the college environments in the United States are toxic. You know, unless you are taking a degree in engineering, chemistry, physics, math, biology, geology, it's only a something, of time something like that, but it's uh, only a matter of time for those, those for those disciplines to go down the shitter yeah. too, you know. But everything else in a college environment is is tinged with uh, the politics of the left and uh, mediocrity and inclusion instead of exceptionalism and achievement, you know. And it's, not only that, employers don't give a shit. I don't. We don't give a shit. It, it, yeah. In my, we life, don't in give my a former shit. life, I, if somebody had a degree, I, I, it made it no different between the person who didn't. No. It, it, there's, and, and we, I, I would a hundred times rather hire somebody without a master's degree in ex-phys as a, a, and would rather hire somebody who's been training three years, right. who started off as a shitty lifter and got their squats and deadlifts up to five exactly. and six. Right, I'd a hundred times rather hire somebody like that as opposed to somebody who has got Brooks and Fahey memorized. Right, I don't care about that. What I care about is what you have learned, and more importantly, what you can communicate to other people about what you have learned, and what you can continue to learn, because you're never through learning. Right. Uh, one of the worst things about a terminal degree, uh, especially in easy disciplines where people don't understand this, is that when you get a when you get an education degree, you get an EDD, <laughs> you actually think you know something. <laughs> it's just amazing. It's amazing. And I don't need a person like that around me. They're not going to contribute. They want to be rewarded for what they've already done instead of being able to contribute to what we're trying to get done. And so Nick and I both told Chase that to, not to go to school, but to keep learning. 
And I, he's done a pretty good job of that. I, have you gotten how far of the way through that book on vertebrate paleo that I gave you? So I'm on the way of how whales came to be and learning about how they started with, I forgot the name of the uh, divergent clade. Well, but, but the idea is that... I'm, I'm uh, learning new things that I never he, thought I'd be right. interested in, in and learning this about. This is specifically why I gave you that book. Yep. That, that is... Uh, that that is a wonderful book because uh uh what you have done by looking uh, at that book and reading it studying it is is that is graduate level after after biology bachelor's degree stuff and uh what i want you to get out of that specifically is the mechanisms by which things change over time all right, the lay public, which knows essentially nothing about anything, has is, is come under the impression that in order for evolution, for biological, uh, phenotypical evolution to take place, that genetic modification must happen. And that's not true. That's absolutely not true. There are other mechanisms at play all throughout evolution. Other mechanisms besides genetics are at play. And that book really opened my eyes to that idea, and I think it's a it's a fundamental text, and uh, uh, it's a that that's that was uh, I thought you needed to to see that because see you don't necessarily always have to follow the path that the chairman of the department has laid out for you. Right, the chairman of the department is not the sole arbiter of how things get learned. All right, I gave Chase this this graduate level uh, vertebrate 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 paleontology text, and he's learning stuff that worked back downstream. All right? Yeah. Well, I mean, to kind of bring this all up, you started me with like you know, a little bit of a simpler book in the sense that, we, you know, you, you made me read about, you know, Mountain Man, stuff that kind of sparked my interest in reading, and then that kind of developed into this mm -hmm. erudition to where I can now read these hard texts, these complicated subjects in right. these books. And not be intimidated by exactly, it. Exactly. And if you don't understand something, then you look it up. Exactly. And if you and if you still don't understand it, you move on to the next thing you do understand. And that's more productive than wasting a bunch of time on a campus with a bunch of little shitheads that have got a different agenda than you do. Now, I still think it would be productive for Chase to go to a school and take Calc 1 and 2. I think at some point you need to do that. I think you need to go to a school and take general physiology with a laboratory and a couple of other things like that. I really, really think that freshman chemistry, laboratory freshman chemistry, the, the chemistry for science majors is a fundamental thing that you need to do. I think you need to do that at a school because the laboratory shit, you, you need to learn laboratory science and that's where you learn laboratory science. I think that uh, uh, that ought to be something you make plans to do here in the next three or four years. If you wait until you're in your 30s to do this, uh, you're probably not going to get it done. And I'm telling you that as you get older, it gets harder to learn stuff. Specifically, it gets harder to remember things that you're learning, that you're reading. It gets harder to remember stuff. And... Uh, when you're my age, it's very, very difficult. You know, the, the primary way I learn things now is by thinking about them. I learn more when I give a lecture in our seminars than I do pretty much any other deal because I learn from listening to myself talk, as odd as that sounds. And there are other people that, that will tell you that they think better while they're talking than they do while they're writing. And uh, that's... Uh, 
That's certainly true for me. But you're you're at the age now where you're just a sponge, and you need to take advantage of the sponge mechanism to uh, soak up this kind of important stuff. All right, well, we gotta might as well take advantage of our studio audience, the studio audience here today. Anybody in the studio audience want to ask Chase a question? Well, I think Ray has a question. Oh. Ray might have a question. Right on cue. So, Chase, did you do a bunch of eights on your press to get it that heavy or what? What did you do to program up from <laughs> low threes to the 405? Uh, starting out. Besides had... learning how to lay back and do a <laughs> standing bench press, which, of course, made it easier. Uh, the, my previous press PR was 350. Um, that was probably at the start of April or so. I was still lingering with that 350. And what body weight was it? That was probably about 245, around the That's same about body the weight. About the same, right. And then I had either read something or heard Nick say about you know the singles, right? And I think he said, try them, which I did. And then I, I gradually started implementing five singles for my intensity day on my press, uh, along with doing a pin press variation, volume press, and then adding a fourth day to where I'm either doing just strict press or isometric presses. Um, I was working from about 300 for singles, five singles, and then working my way up. I was making 10-pound jumps at the start to where I'm getting into PR territory with my singles. So I hit 350 for five singles, and then I said, man, this is really working. My pin press had evolved. It Instead of doing one heavy set of five, I was doing two sets of five. And I was kind of playing with the idea of changing up the rep schemes with that. But, it, you know, it was working, so I'm not going to change it. Um, my volume, on the other hand, I was doing some eights, which probably didn't help. Um, I slowly transitioned that to fives and then threes and uh, a bunch of doubles as well. As I got closer to the meet, I uh, found a way to where I... I kind of knew I was going to be challenged at with the uh, the bar dipping down. And I worked about 20 pounds lower than that. So I did 10 singles around 345. Um, gradually tapered it down to eight singles at 355. Did five singles at 365. And then um, doubles and singles all the way up until the meet. I had planned to do 400 the week before, and I got it to about forehead height, and it failed. Um, so this four or five was going to be kind of a true test and I, I didn't even know if I was going to get it. Uh, my pin presses on the other hand, I have locked out 455 on a forehead height for a single. And then at, at my eyebrow height, I have locked out 425. So I knew that this, my lockout strength was not the issue. It's how do I get my bar from in my hands to about over the shoulder, right? That little, that distance, um, the isometric presses helped a lot. But I, I think I need to play with those a little bit more because um, I have a tendency about throwing that out in front and I can just hold this position here instead of getting it back to uh, my, my midfoot, essentially. And then, yeah, I uh, attempted 405, opened up with 365, opened that up. Yeah, I, I got that. I was used to taking big jumps in training, going from 365 being my last warm up to my work set of either 385, 380, 390, somewhere around there. Uh, so the jump, those big jumps really don't bother me. Um, I failed my first attempt at 405, threw it out in front, didn't really use my hips. I mainly just needed to feel the weight in my hands to kind of associate what I need to do. And I, I talked to, you know, Josh, the guy who was kind of co coaching me. Um, and then I knew what I needed to do. Was that the first that. time you'd ever unracked 405? Oh, yeah. It's the first time. Um, but I had been envisioning that, that rack, unrack sequence, like every single millisecond of the step out and my setup process to the bar being over my shoulders at least a thousand times. I mean, it's, it was keeping me up at night almost. Um, I, I went to Josh. What did I need to do after that second attempt? Throw your hips forward. So I, I told him to use a cue that I've been kind of using with my clients in Houston, mm -hmm. and that's throw your femurs forward. So he's like, okay, I got you. So I'm, I'm back in the warm-up room. I'm just closing my eyes. I'm visualizing the bar path, and then, you know, called my name, went out there, 
and the weirdest thing walking up to the bar everything just faded out like there's a shit ton of people in the room didn't even see a face it was mm -hmm. awfully quiet in my head mm -hmm. heartbeat is through the roof grasped the bar and it just all flooded away got it heard josh yell femurs and then you know laid back did my standing bench press <laughs> <laughs> And a stand, hell of a standing bench press it was. So how uh, critical do you think the four-day-a-week uh, press training was to this process? Oh, it's very critical. If you want to – it Suggs told me a long time ago that those guys, guys in York, the guys that were all bench, pressing 350, said those guys all press four days a week. They do some version of the work overhead four days a week. And if you are going to be serious about your press, you have to do it more than the bench press requires because it's more technique dependent, more bar path dependent, all of this stuff. You just got to get used to the idea that you're going to press the damn thing up. And you can't do that if you're only pressing twice a week. Now, the our novice programming has been criticized because we alternate the bench and the press. So one week you're pressing twice. The next week, you're benching twice. But the novice part of this program is not designed to make you a press specialist or a bench press specialist. It's just general strength and conditioning. And uh, as you for, get further along in your training and, and you kind of decide what you want to do, if you decide you're going to press big weights, four days a week is the key. When did you start to go into four days? Well, that was a couple of years ago. That was... Probably about three years, maybe two years yeah. ago. Because uh, Nick had said, you, you need to start doing pin presses because I was struggling with mm -hmm. you know, the lockout portion and laying back even drastically as the bar got higher. Mm -hmm. um, did that, and then someone said, hey, why not try, I think it was either you or Nick, said try doing the isometric just to see what would happen. Yeah, it was, it was probably me. Those guys did a lot of that stuff, pushing the bar up into the pin and then pushing it on the pin for a three count or whatever it was. The, one of the interesting things is, so you said you <clears throat> you were doing 350 for your PR, and then all of a sudden you're doing a bunch of singles mm -hmm. at 350. And that's exactly what happens. You know, with she PRs at one, Brie over here PRs at 135, two weeks later she's hitting 10 singles yep. at that PR weight. Mm -hmm. And it's, it just shows you that it's, it's practice. You know, it is. It's, it's not the it really lockout is. strength. You know, you can you lock out in excess of a hundred pounds on a bench, so it's not it's not the triceps. It's can you control right? Can and you his, control that kinetic chain? And his his pin press is four fifty five. Yeah, or four fifty. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's uh, the the press is a lot more like snatch or clean and jerk than either the squat or the deadlift, or certainly more than the bench press. It's not just bull through it. If the thing is off. By a half a centimeter, if the bar path is off a half a centimeter, it won't lock out. And I'll tell you what's the most unusual thing about this whole 405 that he did is that the vast majority of the time, you don't PR the I snatch, mean, the clean and jerk, or the press right. on the third attempt at a meet. Yep. Typically, the intelligent lifter goes in and tries to to get his training PR on the third re on the third attempt on the platform. Something you've already done before, but to pull a, a big PR out of your ass on a press on third attempt is real unusual. It's real unusual to do. Well, I would have liked to have done it, it on the second, but well, it would have been yeah, neat. That, but that, if, was, that was the interesting thing about it. That second press just fell right back on you. Yeah, the, I, the, I, the I second knew press, I thought everybody, we all thought, oh, he's fucked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He can't. Yeah, after watching that why in the hell is he going to repeat this? Yeah, I, 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 I threw one. it That's differently. A dead ass failure. I, like yeah. I said, I have to fill the weight in my hands and right. associate it to the movement. A, exactly the point. The fucking thing is exquisitely dependent on bar path. On technique, and if anything is wrong with that, anything's wrong with your technique. If the bar goes forward, it shoots forward. You go too far back, and you can't control the thing. It's not over your feet. Every something's out of balance. The thing won't go. The thing won't go. It just it's like a snatch or a jerk. The it's it's dependent on things 
that you have to practice. And that is why four day a week right. is the key to the press. Yep. Four and they can, days and they a can week. all be heavy because it's not that stressful. Yeah. Right. Like I was doing pin presses the day before my singles. Yeah. Right. And I, I felt totally fun. Yeah. I guess if you're good at pressing, everything can come together and you'll you can get a PR. The the thing is that the meets you know, when we run the meets, most people there are not good pressers. Yeah, well, just the, just who's the actually no, most people there are just there to have fun. Yeah. And that's what the meet's for. You know, and eventually when we get our shit together and we get this thing organized at the national level then we will have a uh, a legitimate press record, an out-of-the-rack press record at all these different weight classes for people to actually train right. for. I don't think that that's uh, going to happen anytime very soon. Both attempts to organize this thing at the national level have fallen on their asses, and we're going to have to get it done, I guess. But, uh, you know, right now we're just having fun with this. Just have fun with these meetings. Uh, anything else? A lot of these guys are going to want to know how the hell they can follow your path and what did you do? Like, how did you eat and all this other stuff? So, there, there's really no following Chase's path because well, nobody else is Chase. Well, but, <laughs> but the problem is, everyone thinks, like, oh, I don't want to gain weight, I'm going to get yeah, fat. Yeah. Like, he's living fucking proof, right? Yeah, so it's well, show no, up at the gym when you're 12 and never leave. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's it. show it's up at the gym when workout. you're 12 with, with type 1 diabetes and uh. Never miss a workout. And never miss a workout. And that's, you know, that's not going to be advice people follow, I don't think. No. You know, but, uh, oh, God. And, and aside from that, nothing else really matters. I mean, do you do you track your food? Do you track? Nope. No. I mean, you I'll just eat it. a fuck ton of food. You train four days a week. Yep. And you never miss a workout. Yep. And all this shit that everybody worries about, this minutia. Is, is supplements all consequential because they're not showing up to the gym and they're not trying to add weight to the bar. Right. So, well, you know, uh, I'd like to thank Chase for being here with us today. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't tell him this very often, but we're real proud of you. Thanks for being with us. See you next week.